last video we discussed about how to insert foreign gene or gene from one organism to a plasmid or a vector and then insert that vector to another or a different organism preferably a bacteria now we, this in this part of the lecture we will be discussing the nuances of that now through this uh, manipulation of the gene we are able to insert genes from higher organisms or uh, more complex organism, for example, your um, the multicellular organisms, the eukaryotes, into your prokaryotic organisms. Now, the implication of that is for eukaryotes, the genes, if you're going to just um, insert the genes from the chromosome itself, eukaryotic DNA contains introns and exons. And um, just a review from your um, lecture, about uh, gene expression, introns are parts of the DNA that are not expressed, whereas exons are the part of the DNA that are expressed. So it's like um, if you are going to imagine your um, your the, the the original mRNA transcript or the, the the DNA, the gene as it is encoded in the into your um, into your DNA or into your chromosome itself, it's like uh, a draft of your say thesis paper. So of course it, it requires a lot of work. You, the, the first draft so it requires a lot of work your your advisor would would, uh, would want you to uh, remove some things you edit out some errors etc so it's like that so the these introns that are interspersed with the exons in your dna are not uh, recognized by what uh, are not rather are not needed when you want to create a protein product you do not want those introns in the way now the problem here is in gene uh, in gene manipulation. If you want to express, for example, um, a certain gene from a eukaryotic cell, say, say uh, let's say um, green fluorescent protein gene. This is from uh, a jellyfish. A jellyfish is a eukaryotic organism. So of course the gene, as it's encoded into the the chromosome, it contains introns and exons. Now if you are going to just insert that gene you cut it straight from the chromosome and into a bacteria, the resulting protein product will not be usable because it contains introns that should not be there in the first place. Now, bacterial cells cannot process those introns because bacteria, unlike the eukaryotes, the prokaryotes do not have introns and exons. So what you see in their genome, into their chromosome, that's what they are expressing as is. So, since they cannot process the introns and the exons, you cannot insert, blatantly insert the, the gene that you cut from the chromosome of a eukaryote into the chromosome or into a plasmid vector and then had the, a prokaryotic organism express that. And that is why we have what we call the complementary DNA. Complementary DNA, these are DNA made from an mRNA template. So, remember, when you express a gene, you, you copy first your, the transcript from the DNA in the chromosome uh, to your mRNA transcript. And in the processing of the mRNA, uh, for eukaryotic processing, they remove the introns and splice together the exons. And so the, the mature transcript, we call it the mature transcript when it's already processed. The mature transcript is now ready for expression. So there is no introns there, any, there anymore. It's the basically uh, going back to the analogy about your thesis, it's the final draft ready for publication. Okay, so the final draft of your thesis. And that is what you wanted to be copied into your bacterial uh, bacterial uh, vector, to your bacterial cells for them to express it. So th these are the copies that are, well, basically ready-made. As you can see, the, the, well, something like an instant copy, uh, just add water, something like that. Anyway. So, how do you make those complementary DNA? So, complementary DNA, uh, you, you start with a mature mRNA, and then you use a special type of enzyme called the reverse transcriptase. The reverse transcriptase, by the way, is also found in the HIV virus. Actually, these are usually seen in viruses. Uh, because virus, their genome, is, or rather their genetic material, is not always DNA. It's sometimes m mRNA. And so this virus, for them to infect other the host cell, they need to convert the RNA gene, their RNA gene into DNA. And they have that's why they have the reverse transcriptase enzyme. And so we have this reverse transcriptase, we extract them from the virus, and then we get the 
uh, we from the mRNA copy that's our uh, that's the original uh, that's for example the copy of the, the the gene you want to express you create a DNA copy and that is called the cDNA or a complementary DNA or sometimes it's called copy DNA so you create a DNA from that mRNA so you have basically a hybrid and then you just use a, a simple polymerase to create a double-stranded DNA and that uh, double-stranded DNA coming from the mRNA original transcript is your cDNA and this can be uh, directly inserted to a plasmid that can be uh, inserted into a bacterial cell and then the bacterial cell can now produce a working protein from that so that's basically your cDNA and that's how you uh, you use a eukaryotic gene or how you express a eukaryotic gene in a prokaryotic system okay so how uh, wh why do we use or what are some of the uses of your cDNA so it's for manipulating genes you change them you you knock them out you insert them to other species or actually you just want to study about those uh, DNA or those genes and um, because these genes are already are basically instant and ready-made it allows you to bypass normal gene controls and it's easy to regulate so you and, and one of the and another one and actually one of the most useful or one of the main reason why we have them is that you can you, you can insert the genes from a complex organism for a eukaryotic organism it's a simpler one like a bacteria and bacterial cells are easier to grow so you can just have it have the the plasmid and then they'll just produce them and you can do industrial scale production from those cDNA okay so that is for uh, why we have cDNAs now um, we already discussed about uh, how do we express your genes manipulating them so let's move on to isolation the gene isolation is one of the ways and how to study the genes so we call it the genome we have the term genome to describe the entire set of the genetic material of an organism basically it's the totality of all the genes in your body now your uh, of course it's a lot of genes so you need uh, and it's very difficult of course to study a whole lot so you just we isolate certain genes and study them one by one so in order to do that we usually have dna libraries and unlike a typical uh, a normal library where is you have a building with a lot of books there when we have a library for a dna library it's basically just a set of cells containing a clone your clone dna fragments and various clone fragments well you can say it's a good uh you have a collection of dna fragments in a certain set of cells it's usually inside a, a petri dish culture and of course how do you know how do you like a library you should be able to uh, store and retrieve so how do you retrieve your your desired fragment dna so you use a probe a probe is a fragment of a dna labeled with a tracer so it, that uh, dna fragment is a complement to the one that you're looking for and uh, you use this probe to find a specific clone carrying your gene of interest because the library, a DNA library, contains fragments of DNA, and they're not. There are many different DNA. Uh, I mean, for example, a whole genome, the DNA of the whole uh, chromosomal DNA. You fragment them, you insert them into. Um, you insert those fragments into your um, bacterial cell, and you create a library. And now you want to get a, just a certain single gene from that library so you need of course the probe and you uh, and that probe enables you to find the one uh, the dna fragment that you are looking for so nucleic acid hybridization is the base pairing between a dna from different sources well basically it's just a hybrid a hybrid you have two different types and then your probe then hybridizes with your targeted gene so this is an example of a dna library so you have um how do you retrieve and process your genes so okay so first you will have your individual bacteria from dna they are spread over your uh, petri dish plate so it's a solid growth medium so you, you do not usually use uh, a liquid medium that is very difficult to to isolate and to get basically the, the one that you decide okay so this colony each colony comes from a single uh, single cell single organism that is that contains your uh, that contains a certain fragment so one whole colony contains only a single fragment that's the idea 
So you you press a paper onto the surface of the growth medium. So so that means you are not getting the whole colony. You are just getting uh, some parts, some representative from each colony. And then you uh, you soak them in a solution that ruptures your cells. And then uh, when the cell ruptures, it releases their DNA, and the DNA clings to that paper. So you add the radioactive probe. And the radioactive probe then attaches to the one the DNA fragment that you're looking for. And then, since it's a probe, it contains a tracer. Usually, it's a radioactive tracer, but right, uh, but currently, the, the one of the more popular ones are fluorescent, fluorescent tracers. So you have um, using that fluorescent or radio uh, using an X-ray film. It's a radioactive tracer. Although I'm, I'm I think it's getting out of use. The radioactive tracers are big are not being used anymore. So you have fluorescent tracers. So of course, you will now, uh, it will light up a spot. And that spot, you will receive that spot and that is the one that you are looking for. Okay, now you have the gene of interest that you want. So you want to study it more. So it's just as, uh, what you can see here is a spot. So that spot contains molecules of the DNA you are, look you are looking for, but it's just a small amount. So you want in order, to study, in order to study them effectively, you need to create copies of them. And that is where uh, the photocopying machine of, um, not exactly photo, but the copying machine of the DNA comes in. So you have what you call a polymerase chain reaction. So it's a cycle reaction that uses heat-tolerant DNA polymerase. It's from Thermophilus aquaticus. We call it the TAC polymerase, T thermus aq aquaticus so that's the tac polymerase it's used uh, because it's heat resistant it doesn't the nature it's, it doesn't get destroyed in the heat and uh, heat cycle of your uh, pcr reaction so you use them to produce copies of the dna fragment so dna copies is mixed with this polymerase and then a uh, nucleotide uh, uh, your nucleotide starting products and you have primers these primers are important because they specify specific regions of the DNA fragment that you want to be uh, want to be cloned or you want to amplify. So you, in this reaction, you cycle high and low temperatures in order. Why do you need to get uh, high temperatures? Because you want to break hydrogen bonds. So at high temperatures, your DNA denatures. So the hydrogen bonds breaks. So you have single-stranded DNAs. And then when you have single-stranded DNAs, your pro primers can be spare, and then you can, you can actually um, uh, se sequence uh, or rather amplify or create more uh, copies of that DNA. So you have basically amplification. So the amplification here is basically this step. So first you have a double-stranded DNA fragment. So because it's double-stranded, you cannot amplify that because remember during replication you need you 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 have helicases in in natural in nature's way you have helicases to break the to get to have the double strand that become single strands or you form a single strand bubbles but in this case you do not have helicase you just have your um tac polymerase therefore you add heat so when it heats or you increase the temperature uh how high is the temperature it's usually around uh if I remember correctly, it's around uh, 90, 90 degrees. So you have high temperature, your double-stranded DNA will naturally denature and become single strands. Now, it become, once it becomes single strand, your primers, the pink ones, can be able to base pair to their uh, target. So you have two sets of primers, the forward and the reverse primers, because you want to have double-stranded DNA products. So these primers attaches. And then you have TAC polymerase using these primers because remember, you do not have primase here. You have primers, uh, predominate primers already. So you have the polymerase elongate the strands from the primers. Now once it's elongated, you have your, sorry, double-stranded fragments. And then you repeat the cycle. So you increase the temperature again to denature these fragments and then you lower them down for your primers to attach. And then you use uh, the polymerase to elongate. So all in all, you get uh, when you repeat the cycle, you will get uh, a times two of each uh, starting material you have. So it's basically an exponential type of reaction. So for example, if you have a single DNA cup fragment, after one round, you will get two. And then another round, you will get four, eight, so on and so forth until the usual cycle is 30. Sometimes it's about 40. 
So that's your PCR. And basically, uh, PCR is also um, one of the, or rather, this is the gold standard. Uh, the gold standard for COVID testing is making use of this PCR reaction. You are identifying the gene of uh, the, the gene of, uh, of the coronavirus. So this is how they do it. Okay. So um, this is for PCR. So in the next uh, part of the lecture, we'll discuss about DNA sequencing.